Well, welcome everyone. Good morning. This is Glenn Thompson, as you see on the screen, and um, thanks for attending, and uh, 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 hopeful that you'll get something out of today's presentation. Um, as you see on the screen, I've been working, uh, and I work continuously as a mentor with PTA, Pacific Trading Academy. Um, if you want to contact us, uh, you have the website, pacifictradingacademy.com or you can uh, utilize the toll-free number 800-339-8588. And again, we are recording today's presentation, so if you'd like to review, you can contact us to get whatever coding is required to our, get the access to the archive. Um, when I was asked to speak, um, ideally I thought that this would be better presented uh, kind of after this week. Um, we've obviously, uh, today the Fed goes to convene, and I think they're going to uh, finish their meeting tomorrow, and we'll find out. But um, projections for September, here we are at the midpoint of the month, um, and so someone asked me, uh, when I sent in a, a, a title, they said, well, we're kind of going to be at the middle of the month when you're doing this. It's Isn't it too late, or shouldn't we be talking about the uh, time period after September? It turns out that this is kind of right on uh, 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 congruent with uh, the uh, interest rate uh, adjustment or not, whether what you know what will happen in the next two days, I guess. Uh, so there's a lot of volatility, and there has been this entire year uh, in the various markets. So uh, that was that gave rise to the title, and I thought it would be particularly timely, given where we are, uh, to discuss what what's left for this month, and as we move into the file, uh, the next few months, uh, I think there's some great opportunities, as I'll elaborate in the next few minutes. Um, if you have any questions concerning what we do at PTA, uh, our programs, uh, and I do teaching um, uh, that uh, complements my own trading. I still trade my own accounts. I've been working with PTA now, I guess, for 15 years since their inception. I've been trading about close to 35. But uh, in any case, uh, the person to talk to, or if you, you may have heard of, from him, you know, he's kind of our dean of admissions, Peter Newman. Frank Cameron runs the company, either of those two gentlemen or anyone you might happen to get, but initially the, uh, primarily uh, Peter Newman handles this. Uh, so that's the person you'd want to talk to if you want to get more details in concerning what I do and my coworkers, the other mentors. All right, uh, let's progress. <clears throat> Projections for September, uh, just a picture. All right, uh, timing always takes precedence over price. Fundamentally, uh, those of you who attended previous presentations um, uh, have heard me say time in and time out, no pun intended, that uh, I get a lot of insight concerning trying to figure out uh, a lot of the noise and the information that's out there fundamentally by first establishing time points. Uh, I don't want to talk about that in particular uh, today, but that serves as an initial kind of, puts it in, a, in an appropriate context or stage by which you will um, I generate the the uh, opportunities that I locate this is a chart that I presented uh, months ago and it's just one of the big moves that occurred in the Swiss franc or this is the dollar Swiss you can see the high volatility this was in response to an adjustment by the, uh, the Swiss National Bank so this year so far and here we are a little past uh, the midway point <clears throat> um, has been marked by tremendous volatility. This was in the first uh, few weeks of the year, if I recall. Back in January, you can see within a, a period of less than, I think, 48 hours, one day or so, well, this is the daily chart of the dollar Swiss. <clears throat> and you can see we've been having all sorts of events um, as precursors and promulgators of tremendous moves. That was then. And this is a this, hap this is now present volatility as reflected just a couple of weeks ago in the stock market. This big move uh, down within uh, just a, I think it began on a Thursday or so and ended on the following Monday. So within a period of four to five trading days, if we discount the weekend, you had a tremendous move in, um, in equity prices. Um, one note before I, or two points I want to bring out concerning what's going on in the stock market. <clears throat> In the last, since this bottom right here where I have number three is the bottom that came in on Monday, I think it was, the 20, August 24, 
the following Friday, the 28th was right here, this top right here. I don't have that marked off or indicated, but if you can see where the pointer is, it indicates that uh, we had rebounded and re uh, retraced about 50% roughly of the move down. This top right here, it's not this this top, you know, if I were to, the numbers, by the way, folks, indicate uh, my estimate for where we are in the context of an Elliott principle count or my wave count, so, so to speak. But this top right here, August 28th, uh, this top right here, uh, August 18. Uh, those of you who have been attending regularly some of the past webinars I've again indicated know that my time point was the 19th. So we caught that uh, we were accurate to with you know a day within a day. Uh, I had projected we were going to, and in fact the big move began the next day on the 19th. But the actual technical top was right here. It was the one day prior to my theoretically projected time point. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm bringing that up for the purpose of pointing, just kind of giving us a means by which we can contextualize the price action we've we've saw in the stock market here. Um, this top may seem not. To, it doesn't stick out as an, as as salient as this top here. Uh, this uh, this was the May 19th. Was this was the July 20 top here and here, and I think it marks the end of correction too. But I just wanted to put this, you know, in the context, people who are maybe beginning, who just pay who are just following the news without some guidelines and criteria or models to evaluate all the types of information uh, might be a little confused uh, at the at the ferocity and the and the speed with which the some of the major financial sectors are adjusting to information as it comes out. All right, so I think we have here in the stock market, this is textbook structure. I, I didn't see the, the magnitude of the move, but as Elliot said, and I tell the students that I teach Elliot Wave too, uh, in his original papers back in the 40s and 30s, when he actually came out with the original paper in 1939, but uh, third waves are wonders to behold. So I think we truly had a wonder to behold in terms of the response uh, the market had been extremely overbought, but that was your third wave. Everything since this bottom, this bottom where number three is. Uh, and by the way, this was the three of the three. This top here, 218, was an internal third wave of the larger degree third that started back here on July 20th, I believe, or the 26th. I, for, I forgot the date, but it's not important. Um, this top right here, February 18, that's why that is more important, marked the internal third of the, the larger degree third. That's in part, why it was so so fast and so and, and moved so far. Um, anyway, notice everything from this bottom here through where we are right now. This is printed out last night. The market in the S and P or the E mini is moved up considerably off of yesterday. Uh, right now, right uh, ten minutes ago, I checked the price. We were around 88 and 70, uh, 88.75, 1988 and, and change. We got up as high, I think, to 1993, so f unless it's changed in the last couple of minutes. But moving up into where I've labeled number four, notice this yellow line. That's my next theoretical projected time point, which comes in next week. Curious, I think that's Tuesday. The autumnal equinox is the following day. So back-to-back -back time points, I think they are one and the same thing. So just so you, and this is important as a possible trade. I'm, this is... Uh, if anything, carry from a practical standpoint, take this away with you today. This vertical line, I, I erased my previous, which was the, the corresponding to this day, the 19th of August. That was my last time point projected theoretically for the stock sector in the U.S. The next one is indicated by this yellow line where I have number four. And it, you can see, so I've got two different ideas. I've got my time points uh, and I'm always, when I work those out, theoretically, for any given market, my next step is to see whether or not I can dovetail or have them reconcile and more or less fit into a, fr a broader framework or a generalized pattern. Do I see where there's agreement between time and price? Because as people like Gann said, uh, and myself, uh, when time and price collude or collide uh, and come together, that's where you typically locate your best opportunities. Um, I should have mentioned, folks, let me take a time out here. If you have any questions as I go along, write them in the control panel area on the right side of your screen. And if I can, I'll address them. If not, uh, I think today, you know, I always say it's going to be a fairly quick presentation, then I end up over-talking. So I will certainly attempt to 
one way or the other, we'll get any questions you may have concerning the trades or any aspect or any rationale or anything related up to this uh, at the end of the presentation today. All right. But what's important is, notice this is kind of triangular and it's extended. We're kind of going sideways to slightly higher. We have a bias. You know, once it hit that top on August 28, which is right here, if you can see this little top here, then more or less a couple of days down, a couple of days up, a couple of days down, a couple of days up. So creating a net wedge or triangular, an ascending triangle. The tops are more stable here. We're kind of, we got, as I said, a high today of 1993. So it's actually a little higher than, this was printed out last night. It didn't have time logistically to um, uh, get this into the slide presentation for today. But just so you know, this was, this settled, this was at 70, so you can see this. This was 1979 and three quarters. So basically we were hoovering around 1980 at yesterday or last evening in the evening market and then we got up today as we're right now at about 88.75 so we're a little higher so you can see it's an ascending triangle that's forming which is very typical of fourth waves which is where I think and why I think the market's doing what it's doing right now my expectation is in a perfect world I'd love to see this continue to complete the triangle reach the apex or the point of the triangle on or around the middle of next week corresponding with my next time point after which I would expect equities to decline once again in order to form wave five, completing the set of five waves that those of you who are Elioticians know is necessary. Then that completes the, the cycle, which I began, pick your poison, pick this top here or here. Uh, from a proportionality standpoint, I picked this, this the top of May 19th. This is the July, was it the 20th or the 26th? I can't remember, whatever. So one, two, or if this is one, this would be two, or one, and then this would be two. Either way, however you want to look at it. But it fits quite nicely, and this was a classic third wave. This is a classic fourth wave triangular, taking a lot of time off the clock, staying within a relatively restricted range. And I expect, theoretically, if, all, if it forms perfectly, where you've got this balance of proportionality between time and price, it would end on or around the middle of next week, for about a week from now, after which this sets itself up for a, a nice and interesting short play. And that's in my head at the moment, the manner by which I would exploit this. All right. Someone has a question right off the bat. So let's, uh, do I sell into strength on this rally? Yeah. It, but yes, in, in principle, I, that's what I would be doing. But we're not yet at the price and time point. Or at least I don't think we are. What, what further, and that's a great question, what further complicates this is I happen to have, as the next set of slides, as some slides and uh, subsequently will show, uh, a time point that happens to be today for a related interconnected market, the bonds. Bond, my, time, my next time point for, that I have projected for the interest rate sector, i.e. primarily the 30-year treasury, is today of all days, September 16. Well, when I... At months ago, or however long ago it was when I worked that date up, today's date, I was not thinking, I didn't, I don't know that it occurred to me that it would be coincident with the Fed meeting that begins, uh, began today and is going to end tomorrow. We're going to find out one way or the other what the policy, are they going to hike the rates or are they going to leave them alone? Um, I don't know that I was thinking about it, so, but I, more or less at the same time I'd worked out today's date, September 16, corresponding to the bond market, I had projected 922 for the stocks. Are they two separate data points or are they a single entity within that win, one week more or less window? That I'm not certain about. So coming, the reason I even mentioned this on your question, what one would do if, one, if, one, if you're aggressive, you sell it kind of into strength, in a literal, you sell the strength. If you're conservative, in principle, one, what, what one might do is as the markets, as you get closer and closer to my time point for this market, which is next Wednesday, let's say, Tuesday and Wednesday, the 22nd and the 23rd, let's say, considering those as a single entity, you raise a, you raise a sell stop, keeping it one or two levels of uh, support underneath the market so that you require a, prime, a big move to trigger and initiate your, and establish your short position in the market. So that's conservatively how I do it. If you're a more aggressive trader, uh, you know, again, probably as you get closer to the time point, you just put, you go at the market, something like that. So in principle, one way or the other, depending on, you know, to what extent you, character, you define yourself as a, an aggressive or more risk averse trader, but strategically, yeah, I'll be selling the strength here is what my, uh, how I anticipate exploiting this um, 
collision between time and price, if you will. All right, we had another question. It seems the bears are tripping over themselves today, and they are covering, uh, pushing up the bids. That might be, that's a little, might. yeah, I mean, I, from a day trading, if I'm not, the answer is yeah, I agree, that might be the case. Um, covering, let's see, cover, uh, covering, pushing up the bids, yes, largest short interest in history. Uh, Glenn, can you please give your target for the, ooh, you know, I don't have a target. Um, struck, I, I see that's actually a price target is rather simple to do. I, I would, and now here's the thing, what complicates this, and I'll, uh, I appreciate the question, it's an appropriate question because it would give you some bearings on how to do this, and I'll come back to that, but this, this is where the traders who I work with, and I'm, this is a little commercial, I'm not trying to solicit, but um, at the time I do a trade, I send a signal out to the people on my email list, so you know exactly how and what and where. But yes, you want to. I want to fine tune this as much as possible. We know that, for example, just to touch and to, to at least peripherally address your question, what do I know about fourth wave structure? I know that typically it maxes out around 38% retracement of the preceding third, right? So I would do that. That's going to be one of the uh, relationships that I would try and uh, think about to enable me to establish uh, a likely price level where I can expect the market to uh, not be able to negotiate overhead resistance and therefore come down. I might do what I, I teach, what I call a signal reversal concept where I identify the most extreme bar in, in, the, in a session or in a, for a segment of market's history, and then the low of that bar represents where the buyers are, or are not. If the market takes out the low of the highest bar in a period of time, that's an indication that the buying is dried up, and, the, and then my sell order would uh, kind of be the beneficiary on a probabilistic standpoint of, of that downward momentum. So there's a host of ways, but it's quite simple. I would guess, you know, I doubt I don't think, you know, again, we're trading right now about 15 minutes ago at 88, 89, we got up today as high as 93 and change, if I recall. Um, I don't see structurally this going much higher than this this top here on, on August 28 or this top right here, I forgot the date, or, you know, in an area. It, 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 just looking to see, look at where where we are. This is, little, this is last night, so it kind of got up a little higher today. This is where I anticipate in time the market to turn, marking the onset of the formation of wave five, taking the market down. By the way, fifth ways, it's probably a little easier for me to address once I get short where I think this is going to go. I don't think it'll take out the end of three. I don't think it'll take out this bottom. Even if I'm correct, I don't anticipate we're going to take out this level. Notice, I wanted to, sh I should have drawn a trend line. This is the pivotal bottom back October 15, the middle of October of last year. This bottom right here, if you can see this on the very left-hand side of the screen, notice where we are. Notice where this is as a reference point to where we are right now. And notice at the beginning of the year, the uh, January 2nd, kind of, uh, where is it, right in here, we're just a, a very, you know, 30 points, 30 S&P points below or 20 some point, 20 to 30 points below where we were at the beginning. So even in light of this uh, waterfall decline that we saw a few weeks ago, the market for the year so far, and there's still a few months left in, in 2015, I think, I, I think it's conceivable we could be uh, into new highs by, before the end of the year or at the end of the new year. And I'll have a little more to say by that. Um, even though, by the way, folks, I know this is just the S&P. Uh, the Dow, for example, did take that out, you know, so depending on the index. But using this as a bellwether, in a sense. Okay, let me, uh, let's see. What other questions? Yeah, I don't have a particular price target, uh, uh, whoever asked that. That's easy to work out. I don't anticipate it's going it, to, it, it will be constrained by the amount of time. Again, price is a function of time, is my uh, theoretical pre pre uh, premise, starting point. So the fact that we have a dwindling, you know, a week left, of uh, which, you know, two days, basically two to, uh, two to four days of opportunity for the market, in my estimation, to do whatever movement further to the upside, then I expect because of the, the fact that time and price are coming into balance, I expect a decline to occur. 
I, it could be, you know, in what's complicating this is the fact that whatever pronouncement we ex we get out of the Fed tomorrow uh, could modify all of this. All bets are off depending on what happens tomorrow um, with the pronouncement of the Fed. So we'll see. All right. Let's see. Small speculator short index futures, largest extreme levels ever. Your chart is E-mini, not S&P cash. That's correct, Rich. Yeah, this is the uh, E-mini uh, S&P futures. Uh, SPY dividend pays out tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that, but great. Uh, um, th so that's going to, that could impact uh, all of this, but uh, let's, it, I find that interesting too, a coincidence or, or a co coincident event relative to the, you know, whatever monetary policy pronouncement we'll get or action. Maybe they're going to, maybe there will be an action or a non-action, but again, that's further complicating. So I've got to, you know, strategically take this into account. I, you know, maybe, Again, let me reemphasize a point I glossed over a minute ago, and that is it's possible if we see whatever, whatever happens tomorrow with the interest rate situation, if there is an, a hike or if there's a status, a, a laissez-faire where they just do nothing and we further delay the rate, the rate hike that's been talked about for months now, the market might respond. And what I'm anticipating for the stock sector in the U.S. to commence next week might commence uh, a week early, given the the obvious fundamental potential catalyst of uh, that's going to em emanate forth from the Fed. So I've got to take that into account. We might have a little shorter than typical fourth wave, and we might see the onset of wave five for the stocks uh, quicker than I anticipate. I am not certain the response of the market, regardless, you know, if the if the Fed hikes rates this month, tomorrow, let's say. It indicates their policy. The market might respond positively because it's no longer an uncertainty. It's an event that has been discussed, um, uh, reflected, and conjectured for months. Uh, you know, we haven't had a hike since for years, since March of 09, the end of the uh, the bear market, um, in a sense. And so we've been at this very low interest rate policy uh, uh, regime for years. And to the extent for the last year or so we've been discussing the possibility of a rate hike, the fact that there's been such a long delay heretofore for that occurring represents uncertainty in the market. The fact that they might have a rate hike, which ostensibly often would be price depressant for stocks, could in this turn, at this time, given the new ramifications, uh, cause the market to act positively. So I'll kind of wrap that up at the end, but let's move on. Money flows towards the greatest rates of return. I'm kind of stating the obvious here, just to kind of highlight my next point. It's always looking uh, for higher and higher. It's kind of like uh, heat flow studies. Uh, uh, areas of heat always uh, try and move to colder areas. Inter this is just a, this is a slide that I've shown previously to illustrate some basic fundamental intermarket uh, connections. Rising dollar, lower commodities, especially oil, things like that, to the extent uh, the commodity is priced in U.S. dollar terms. Bonds, there tends to be an inverse relationship between the interest rate, the cost of money, uh, and bonds go up, stocks go up in general. Falling dollar, just the opposite, same relationships. And if, if, you, uh, if you, through periods of deflation or inflation, there's a decoupling of the bond stock interconnection that we often see, depending on what happens, whether it's a deflationary or inflationary environment. So this is just a basic starting point of some of this, the central interconnectedness uh, of the major sectors in our economy. All right. This is the U.S. dollar. So r relative to that, this is the dollar you can see. Uh, this is the longer term chart from 2011. It's a weekly chart of the U.S. dollar. Uh, through present, um, printed this out again last yesterday evening. You can see this top here. So I think I expect the dollar to be more or less in decline at least for the next few months. Notice the this is down here the commercial. They're at their not their largest right in here a couple of months ago, but uh, uh, corresponding with the top here. But we're s certainly uh, going back for a period of years. Certainly toward near the l largest. Net, net short position that they've been in, and that tends to suggest uh, further declines in nominal dollar prices to come in the future. This is just a closer, more uh, resolution, higher resolution view. This is a daily chart of the U.S. dollar. Uh, notice as the price has been falling, rising open interest, 
uh, rising volume co corresponding with uh, the idea that I can expect uh, persistent uh, continued uh, uh, drops in U.S. dollar. Notice the red line, the commercial, uh, they're, again, they're not at their lowest, but they are certainly bearish or in their positioning relative to the small spec, which is the blue line. It's not the uh, mirror image. Uh, that would even be more bearish, but it's certainly bearish for the U.S. dollar right now. So going vis-a-vis -vis the previous slide, as the dollar, uh, as I expect the dollar to uh, go down, as I do, that augurs well or to bid commodity prices. Uh, longer term bonds down, longer term stocks down. Uh, but you, it depends on how we define long-term, intermediate, short, etc. But in principle, I, as a starting point at least, I, from an intermarket standpoint, I expect uh, some pressure on, on U.S. dollar prices, uh, at least in the short term here. All right. Okay, so interest rates. I have been talking uh, for weeks uh, about um, watching the 30-year Treasury uh, as, a, as an insight, as a telescope into what the Fed's going to do, kind of more or less if I could place myself inside and think from the vantage point of the bond market and interpret that as a means of what they were going to do. The idea is if the bonds were rising, uh, interpret that to mean that the bond market at least did not expect the Fed was going to raise rates sooner rather than later. If the bonds fall, um, you can expect that uh, there was going to be a, an interest rate uh, hike. Well, we were rising up until point number three. This is my little wave count for the bond sector here. Uh, and then in the last few, uh, just today, yesterday, we kind of moved down. We've moved down slightly into this Gartley region. This is These are just the Fibonacci overlay, 62, 79%. And here's the yellow line indicating what I mentioned earlier today. Today is a time point. So here we have a, I think, a very interesting opportunity to exploit <coughs> um, what, what, again, I'm not, this doesn't in an explicit sense uh, make a prediction about what the Fed's going to do tomorrow. Are they going to raise rates? But what it does tell me is that if, if we're coming into a time point, and to the extent we see in retrospect that the market proves to be sensitive to this point, to September 16, then that would, in the very basic way of, of making an initial projection suggest I ought to be considering the, exploiting the long side of this market. What is the market doing as it touches down on that next important, uh, potentially important point in time? Well, it's falling. And as such, an outright mirror image polar, polar type of reversal would mean that it would stop going down and more likely reverse to the upside. So the way I'll do this, I will be buying into the weakness. I do the opposite of what a questioner a few minutes ago, the, the question we addressed a few seconds ago for the bonds, typically expecting the bonds to lead equities higher, you see. So I am geared, my bias at this moment is to be setting up, as we see, and everything is setting up crystally clear, perfect for a decline into today. Today, is here we are, and we are right here. We had a kind of further drop. I'm not the last price about 15, 20 minutes ago, right before I got on online with you guys, we were trading at a, a price of about 152.11. I think today's high was 152.12 uh, or something, or something just uh, short of the, we were trading just, so we're a little right in here somewhere, just in and around this, maybe a little below. I forgot if we're in the Gartley range or right at it, but the idea is I'll be trading, I'll be looking to trade above the high of the low. Folks, bear with me. I got, of all times, I left my office window open and the gardener is here. So I've got to stop the noise. Hold on one moment. Interesting. All right. Sorry about that. All right. Yeah, I've got another window too far away. I'm on a headset, so I'll, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, so, yeah, I think this clearly sets up for an, an interesting opportunity to exploit. Uh, this is an obvious wave count, one, two, this is a typical three, and moving into today. So, we'll, you know, I would, you can't say that I'm, I, I'm certainly not afraid to um, objectively interpret what my indicators and models are telling me. It would have been a lot safer for me to have this presentation, you know, on Friday or, or on the weekend. Um, 
I'm going to have a repeat Saturday of this, so I will make any and all adjustments uh, as necessary, given whatever happens between now and the end of the week. But this is the data. This is what traders, this is what we do. Uh, given you work and play the information and utilize the information that you have at any given point and try and best anticipate to some extent um, most pl the more, more probable trajectories uh, given your, what your models are suggesting. So again, purely from a trend standpoint, since this top here through where we are right now, we've been trending down, I expect the fact that uh, I have a lot of confidence in today as a timing point. I don't think it's purely coincidence. I don't know what it is, but uh, the fact that the Fed begins meeting right in, you know, and will issue some statement, I guess, tomorrow, uh, in, in pretty decently congruent with my time point and some type of um, uptick in volatility can be expected and I think there's a tradable opportunity here in the interest rate sector all right so this is just some uh, a listing of obvious connections so if bonds uh, let's say and, and I'm going to use because we're at a particular this is a generalization uh, screen it indicates just general price uh, interconnected general um, um, tendencies and uh, correlations, but we are at a particularly, you know, not all things are equal all the time, and I think the the thing that's going to tip the balance in terms of um, an initiate, a catalyst, if you will, will be the fact that, you know, uh, whatever pronouncement comes <coughs> forth from the central bank tomorrow, let's say. So if the if the bonds respond negatively, then I can expect that will support uh, dollar prices. Oil would go down, metals will go down. By the way, metals are up today, and you had an, and a, this, a couple of slides. I think I have a slide of gold in the next upcoming slides, um, and I'm looking to go long in that. But we're already up. Um, that could change given whatever happens uh, with uh, uh, with the bank and stocks down. I am this the right side. I'm expecting bonds are going to in the near term in re, you know whether it's whatever happens tomorrow or something else. I, I am less concerned. I don't start fundamentally. I start with um, <clears throat> address utilizing whatever tools I have technically um, and try and figure out the most probable uh, course or direction for a market or trajectory. Or, and so I am expecting near term the bonds are going to go up. That would continue the uh, decline we've seen in in um, in the dollar. Oil is a special case because we moved up today, uh, but uh, and my next time point for that is your slide will show I think is October six, and then subsequent to that November six. But that's a different thing. I'll come back to that maybe. And then the metals I expect if we see this, if the bonds respond positively to what happened in the next few sessions, I expect that will lift metals prices and stock prices. So this this right side if then scenario is what I am. Oh, what happened is what I'm favoring. So, uh, but we'll see. You know, if if I if we see uh, something which makes sense um, in response to. Uh, what happens with the Fed, the central bank's pronouncement tomorrow will will adjust. But again, this is what I anticipate is most likely to occur. One, regardless of what the Fed does, this is the, the right side set of relationships is what I think will, in the near term, carry the day, so to speak. All right. All right, gold trade. And this, again, this was printed out uh, just for, I don't have enough time to put all, you know, reflect the most recent changes. But gold moved up significantly, as did silver this morning. But this was printed out yesterday evening. Notice from you could count from a wave count standpoint. I didn't put the numbers in on this chart. This could be the start of a bull move of a cycle. This bottom here, uh, that was July 26, if I recall. This top right in here, August 28th, I think. That's one. This is could be wave two. You can kind of have the A, the B, the C, right into this degree of retracement known as the Gartley, a little triangular structure in here. And then we had a big move up today. We're kind of trading at uh, gold, uh, again, right before I got on to the program, we were trading at about $1,120 and change per ounce. And my time target, the last time target I had projected for gold and silver was Friday, this past Friday. So given a couple of days, not counting the weekend, it was, you know, we had a big move. And I believe it could mark the start of a little, a third wave, taking the market to higher prices. Again, we had a big jump. We're at last night, where this is at $1,103. Uh, we're trading right now at about uh, 11.20. So we're up $17 on the day so far, based off of yesterday's uh, close, basically. 
So and so again, representative of time and price coming together. Uh, the price being this uh, degree of retracement that has a statistical uh, backing that, that suggests about 70%, 75% of the time. When you have that amount of retracement uh, of a preceding trend, it tends to re move up. And I can expect conservatively we should test this top here. And the gold and, and similarly for silver, I don't think I put the silver chart in, but it's the same geometric structure as what we're seeing in gold. Okay. Uh, this is, oh, okay. Um, the dollar. This is a way that I plan and I have on very short term. I've just been in and out of the dollar yen and the yen uh, for, you know, since the, since about for the last week. I've been kind of shorter term intraday trading the yen and the dollar yen on the forex pair and or in the futures however you want to do it or if you're in, in the equity side you can trade ETS but very crystal, crystal clear very clear cut wave structure this is a chart of the what is this December yen the futures so this bottom here represents say a wave the start of a wave one this is your one this is your two and then notice this uh, rocket uh, launch is a classic wave three and and then everything since look at here's your A B C D and it's little final move down and look look at last this is until last night could be the e of a five wave triangular fourth textbook doesn't get clearer than that unless it does but this is you you got to be yeah you're just not paying attention if you're not uh, cognizant of what this chart is showing this is almost too easy there are cases there are times practically speaking folks where um getting following the crowd uh you can uh be a, a you can be a recipient of the momentum. There is the self-fulfilling prophecy factor, and to some extent, you know, the crowd doesn't isn't always wrong. It's just that they're wrong more often than not. Um, and also, not everyone is aware of this pattern. But to the extent you see this pattern, and this is textbook, you, you'd have to. It's going to take an awful lot of contraindications to uh, hesitate not getting positioned in this case long the yen. Um, I do I do the forex spot pairs, so I'd be selling dollar yen as I did a few times since last week, and I plan on reinitiating those positions. So this is another trade. It's an indirect way to exploit my projected depreciation in the U.S. currency. Um, the reason the yen, I think, I expect structural improvement in fundamentally, and for a number of other factors in the yen, they've been depressed for the last few years, and I expect they are uh, needing to rebound out of that. So I think this is one of the ways by which I play the uh, the short in the dollar what I'm anticipating all right so that's another scenario that I like right now it, it, you know if the people who I, I consult are on my trading list so I'm not giving you an exact date in price but that's in principle this is a setup uh, ready to go at any in in the next few sessions probably in all probability all right oil again this these charts were all printed out last night Again, just logistically, I would not have had sufficient time get based on the most recent data. I knew that this would be an issue it's coming into because of the time, where we are in time relative to some of these critical central integral uh, sector markets, bonds, or the precious metal, gold, oil, uh, the stock market, etc. And we had a kind of a, a little move up, curiously enough, even though, you know, this is my next time, these two vertical lines, this is October 6th, and this is November 6th, I didn't put the date here, just didn't, but this vertical line here, the first one to the right, reflects my next projected theoretical time point, the point, and, and I, by the way, this does not in any way, the line itself doesn't tell me if it's going to be a top or a bottom. That's a separate issue. I have to utilize other factors to determine uh, what are the probabilities of it corresponding to a top, and if so, at what level, or a bottom, and if so, at what level. But it's not the price uh, data. This is a pure time point, and as this, this. But we had a move up. Oil uh, is trading, as I last checked, um, ooh, didn't, I forgot to get a quote. Uh, oh, no, I have it, 46 uh, around $46.69. So this last night we're at $45 a barrel and we're up at uh, 46 and a half, 46.70 right now. We had a little, we had, we're up in this uh, area between, you know, uh, just over $46.50 per barrel. So we had a little move up today. I'm not quite certain how to play that because here, if you can see the Fibonacci overlay, um, I can, I think it's a temporary situation. A lot of the markets, you know, from a, if I attempt to interpret 
fundamentally what's going on in the la in the, uh, from yesterday through the probably the end of the week or through tomorrow through the point when the market actually gets knows what the Fed is going to do I think a lot of the major sectors the financial sector markets especially or in particular are acting defensively you know the bonds are moving down in anticipation that the Fed is going to have a hike sooner rather than later the stock market is moving up so that if it doesn't like whatever the Fed does, and it and it moves down. It will be moved, and it should respond negatively by off, you know, being pushed or offered down. It will be offered down from a higher price. So a lot, and then the other markets, oil, metals, etc., are responding in kind, indirectly to. They're discounting uh, whatever a piece of information, whatever policy enactment uh, is is stated. Um, to the extent it's not perceived positively by these paper these paper asset markets, uh, they're taking they're moving in a manner that would be defensive, so as to dampen any uh, uh, the net, the ramifications of such. And so that's what's going on here, um, fundamentally. Uh, okay, so this I, I, yeah this is just to show you my next time point is 10:6, so that's still a few weeks off in the future. I am so I have no position, so I don't have a trade per se in oil at the moment. I have a, I'm leaning towards expecting whatever appreciation in the energy sector we see in oil, it will be a, an opportunity to go short. My bias is to exploit the short side of the oil market at this point. If I had talked to you, I guess in the last webinar, I was saying we could only get down to about 39. Well, here's this bottom. We actually went down a little lower, 37. This is basis October oil. I have revised that. I see we could go down to around $33 per barrel oil. It might be that it will correspond with this time point of October 6th, but again, for the people that I consult individually, they are privy to the specific signals, but, you know, if I do other webinars in the interim, we may get an update on that, but as of this moment, even though we are trading right now at about 40, over 46, you know, between 46 and $47 a barrel basis, the October contract, I expect this is a, a blip up, but um, more likely we're going to see, uh, you know, a, a move down to 30, between 33 and 30 dollar barrel oil. I know that there's some analysts. I think Goldman Sachs. I've read a report or heard about a report last week where they're projecting 20 dollar barrel oil. I haven't. I don't know exactly the data that they were using to project that, but my analysis indicates we could get down to the 33 dollar area. All right. This is just a, a, a final wrap up of what I'm expecting. Uh, Euro, uh, uh, certainly I'm not delving on this. The two primary situations fundamentally in the world, I guess, for the last couple of months uh, that it, it, because of the interconnectedness of all the financial markets uh, have been critical and integral, I think, are the situation with Greece and the European Union and the IMF and so forth, and the situation in China. Uh, I think it's overblown. Personally, again, I'm not uh, I, I'm not uh, primarily a fundamentalist, but I I am very optimistic uh, for the U.S. in a relative stance. In spite of, I am aware of the, the deficit, 18 plus trillion. Um, but I think whatever I think I am okay with the the policy as enacted by the Fed thus far. Um, either way, whether we see the hike um, in 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 rates. Uh, tomorrow or if it is going to be a further delay I've been saying for months I don't I did not anticipate that the Fed would raise interest rates until 2016 I've modified that in the last few weeks my thought is they could if we don't raise them tomorrow or this month let's say it could come before the end of the year um, in either case I think the markets ultimately the stock market in particular will respond positively uh, to this does that suggest that I am sanguine to the point where um, I don't. Re I, I am. Um, uh, you know, I've got my head in the sand. I don't think that there are major structural problems in the U.S. as there are in the entire glo globally. No, it's just I'm saying I'm very. I think in balance. I always got to look at this from a ratio perspective or cost benefit. Uh, that the potential positives far and away outweigh the uh, the negatives. Um, you know, I have. A, you know, fundamentally, to the extent a nation or a sovereign state uh, can uh, maintain you know, a quantitative easing type uh, policy uh, is the extent to which they can engender confidence. And as long as there's uh, the capacity to tax the people, uh, we can service the debt. Is that a ultimate solution? Certainly not. Certainly not. I'm not, I'm not oblivious to the major structural 
uh, situation. But I, I do, um, you know, there are many, what do we call them, black swan type events. There are nonlinear events uh, that history tells me time and time again have uh, served to be a countervailing force, if you will, against some of the, uh, the, um, the, the debt issues and the problems that are structurally um, uh, wrecking havoc on an economy and I think very often you know we're hard-pressed if we think completely linearly where it's very difficult to see around a corner uh, where solutions may lie but again just as a quick rack up, wrap up what's most important I expect further declines in the US and so an obvious play on that is to go along the yen and short the dollar or one in the same they are one in the same things I expect appreciation in stocks regardless of whether whether the Fed raises interest rates tomorrow or next month or December of 2015 or if we delay it into the first quarter of 2016. Oil I expect short term meaning into the one of the next two time targets that I have projected in the preceding slide October 6 and curiously enough a month later November 6 declines and then I once it has reached that price target of you know between 30 33 dollar oil let's just say then we may see begin to see an appreciation. I'm not quite in terms of the detail of that, whether or not we'll be at higher oil, you know, by the end of this year or or not, I'm not certain. I'm not certain as to the window of time within which I expect further declines in oil. But it's quite conceivable they may fit in that framework that I've outlined. Again, October 6, November 6 for oil. Um, it might be that we move up in oil. Maybe today was the beginning. I don't. I think it's more defensive though. I don't think what we saw today in the oil price rising out of that uh, Gartley region was the onset of a big bull move. I think it's just a defensive moving, uh, a blip up, a counter move within a broader bear market still. Uh, and I, I expect further declines. So I am more likely of the opinion that the October 6 time point for oil will correspond to a bottom. Okay, bonds. Uh, again, regardless of what the Fed does, I'm expecting uh, any day now. Uh, given the price action falling for the last couple of sessions and certainly from the recent top, pivotal top, where I had marked number two, the end of, uh, or number three, excuse, whatever it was, whatever that point, whatever that wave was, I expect we are getting ready to go. I'm, the trade, one, a given trade right now is to, uh, I expect, will be to go long in bonds. And the way I'm doing it, I'm selling, I'm going to buy into the weakness. So the uh, kind of the opposite of what someone asked me about with the stocks, I'll be selling into strength in the stocks, buying into weakness in the bonds is how I plan to exploit this. And then the third wheel here, the third trade is going short the dollar, which I will plan to do by going establishing long positions one way or the other in the end. Those are the three trades that I'm uh, expecting. And, oh, and there's a fourth possible situation in the metals, going long in the metals, I anticipate. But that's the least. The most important situations that I think are most immediately upon us Long in the bonds, um, uh, short in the stocks, and uh, long or long in the yen and or short the U.S. dollar. But the way I'm exploiting that again is by uh, I will be selling dollar yen, however you want to do it. But those are my um, anticipated um, trades of the moment or in the next few sessions per se to give us perspective. Let's see, come back and see if we have any questions. That's this is the that completes uh, the ideas. Let's see, I have a few questions here so I can back up and see kind of where we are, guys. All right. Ooh. Uh, let me just see. Let me back this up a little bit. We've, I have a few minutes, so I have plenty of time. I'm glad for the questions. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's see here where I left off. Someone, okay, someone's saying spy dividends pay out tomorrow. Yes, Rich. Uh, on the four-hour chart, it is a triple top with negative divergence on daily. It suggest that the breakout has resistance of 2013 area uh, that makes perfect sense if you're looking at that harmonically related four hour intraday chart um, and you see a zone of overhead resistance in the uh, to, to 2013 again um, uh, e here here's a thought L looking at a more macro or globally or the bigger picture here yes I agree with your comment or point there um, even though I'm talking about the mar this, the stock sector or the equities uh, uh, trade offered down, uh, remember, I think it's a fifth wave. Fifths in general, 70% of the time, are not going to be as large as thirds. Now, I don't know. I can't. I did not anticipate the size or the magnitude and the much less the velocity of the decline in wave three. 
um, I knew that there was going to be a big change on or around August 19, and it actually began August 18. But I had no idea that it was going to be as severe, the severity of the move. But here's what I do know. Uh, to the extent you have very powerful third waves, 70% of the time, the fifths, the, the subsequent fifths, tend to be more muted or damped, dampened. Um, and uh, but that's still 30% of the time. So there's some chance it could be an equally powerful move. I don't think so. I just, I just think the market, whatever the Fed does, you know, and, and by the way, folks, I'm talking about the Fed move tomorrow or non-move, whatever the case is, because that's the primary uh, scheduled event fundamentally on the horizon that's going to do to, you know, we're going to know one way or the other uh, tomorrow wh by the end of the session or earlier in the, uh, whatever time they, com they come out with a, a statement. We'll know. Here's a, a bigger point, though, to generally put this in a bigger perspective. If the, Fed were, if, if, for, if the Fed had not scheduled a meeting this week, it would be some other factor. In other words, the point I want to make here is the structure and the reconciliation and the very deep cyclical components that are responsible at much deeper levels, that are uh, unmoved and un insensitive to all this little meandering fundamental stuff from one day to the next. If it weren't the, that the Fed were meeting this week, there would be some other event or series of events that would bring about the very projections for the various sectors that I'm referring to. It just happens that an obvious fundamental catalyst is uh, what the Fed's going to do with interest rates or not tomorrow. But it, I, so that's why I'm highlighting that. But I don't want you to think that I'm, uh, I, you know, I constantly am looking at the Fed. I look at the Fed when they are an obvious uh, e uh, event or factor, and they are certainly on that level. But if, again, if they weren't meeting and if there was no uh, 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 discussion or no concern or no obvious uh, change in interest rates that was being speculated, then it would be some other event. You know, who, whoever knows what it would be. Okay, so yes. So I'm saying that once that fifth wave was over, and my next time, again, I have not projected a time point subsequent to next week for the stock sector, but um, I'll be curious. It might be that I, you know, we see a, a, a big move down in order to form wave five, and it completes next week. In other words, it might be that I am thinking about this in, you know, I, let's go back. Let me show you graphically what I'm referring to here. Uh, where is it? Let me show you something on the chart just so you see. Oh, by the way, yeah, all of this move, this was the top here, August, that was, I think, August 28th or, no, the 24th. That was the same day the stock market bottomed out on the big move down, then the corresponding, obviously, an inverse relationship. And then we've been moving down into today, as I would expect. Um, well, initially, I always thought we were going to move up, but the fact that we're moving down tells me that we're going to, you know, whatever happens in terms of interest rates, the bond market is likely to uh, respond positively to it and as such go up, taking the market. And from a wave standpoint, that would suggest the formation of a fifth wave. How high it goes is anyone's guess, but that's a separate issue. But you can see structurally, I'm set up. We have this reconciliation by my price and time. Okay, so that's the bonds. Let's move it back to the chart. I want to show you the stock market here wherever it is. Oh, here. Yeah. Okay. So if it's possible, if, if for whatever reason, the, the, um, this doesn't, this is my next known piece of data for which I have 90% or greater confidence that the market will be sensitive to. That is 922, 923, a week from today, let's just say. It may be that what I'm suggesting is that the market will not just drift relatively uh, it, in a very um, tenu tepid way, just, you know, in the doldrums between now and the middle of next week, especially in light of, you know, if something dramatic happens with uh, in response or the market's response or the market rather responds dramatically to what the Fed says, let's just say. So it's possible that a fifth wave could commence uh, any day now in tomorrow, and we could have a very high velocity decline into it could, you know, next week this time, the market could be down here, approaching, testing this support in what would be, in retrospect, my, my analysis and comment and, and takeaway would be that would be the fifth wave, in which case that would mark the, I would I'd be setting up for a reversal on or around the middle of next week to do what? To go long. So you got to put that into context or not. Maybe the market will just respond 
uh, it will be a lack of a response or if whatever response will be muted and will continue to form this more fully formed triangle into my next time point, then I would expect some other series of events to prevail, pushing the market down. The, and it, begs, it really gets me back full circle to the question I said. I am not quite certain at this juncture, at this moment in time, whether I should consider my 922, 923 time point to be one and the same as today, today's time point for the bond market, September 16. In other words, is it, are they one and the same large window time point within that given a week of a, uh, a week time period, or should I consider them as two separate events? You know, it might be that there's a time turning point uh, that this market, the stock sector, will respond to right now or in the next session or two, especially taking into account the possibility of a hike, and then that would be the catalyst to start a fifth wave that would last into next week, marking a bottom, or not. So I'm, those are the two plausible scenarios. So to, in either case, I expect sooner, you know, the, the immediate trade would be to go short in the in the in the um, in the uh, um, uh, stocks. The other possibility, there's another possibility though. We haven't, uh, as long as we haven't, if we haven't taken this out, this top, this topping area in here, it's possible that this was the fourth, and this is a one, and this is a two. Is there, there's some also there's some alternate wave counts I guess is what I'm saying but again the most plausible one is what I've indicated on the screen so let's go back to the questions VIX forming a V bottom today at highs presently market is already down by nine points from high of the of the day as per negative divergence will I buy or sell the 30 year bond I'm looking to buy it and the way I'll do it is I'll be buying the the weakness. I'll be looking for the, um, you know, and so I'll take a look at, I don't, I don't know what the market's trading at the moment, but as soon as I hang up, I'll get the quotes and see what's where we are. If we're trading at um, 152.20, uh, 152.11, wherever, I'll take a look at, I'll be looking to buy at a couple of ticks above the high of, 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 of the day. So that's my strategy for the bonds. All right, let's see what's going on. This means I am bullish on the bonds, if you're correct. Yeah. Um, regardless. Very good. Um, that's, that's one of the discrete trades. I'm looking, unless, you know, if tomorrow, if I haven't, if I'm not triggered into my long position in the bonds, let's say, uh, and then if, and however the market's uh, collective response is tomorrow, given whatever information comes out, Whatever happens with the policy, if they do nothing or not, I'll be looking and anticipating a change in the, in the quality of behavior and the attributes that we're seeing in the bond sector, in the interest rates. And I, uh, my bias to expect directionally is that it's going to be a long trade. If something happens to throw all of this out completely out of kilter, then I've got to change correspondingly. I'd be a fool to, to not. But where we are, given everything I'm aware of, looking at the price action and where in on the timeline it's occurring right now my present bias is to exploit the long side of the nominal bond the 30-year treasury if you're trading ETS folks you know TLT TBT these are ETS or funds you could do um, to trade it um, if you're an options trader uh, you have to again the specifics how you do it and at them you know these uh, you'd have to get a little more detail on everything and your trade sizing all of those details I'm not getting into that you have to have a consultant or, or unless you know how to do it for yourself certainly okay uh, let's see oh there's another a couple of other questions all right let's see here uh, by my stance on the dollar bonds gold am I making a guess that the Fed will that's that's my yeah I'm about set okay folks yes that's exactly whoever's asking this I'm if you have to to quantify this I am of the opinion, and I, I don't know, who am I to uh, uh, second-guess the Fed, but I don't even understand when they come out with a statement. Sometimes I can't even make heads or tails of it, much less when there, it hasn't happened yet. But I, if you ask me at this very moment, do I expect the Fed is going to have a hike tomorrow? No. 70% expectation they're going to delay it. If I had talked to you a month ago, I would have said that we would not see a rate hike by the Fed until next year, 2016. I have in the last couple of weeks, in fact, softened that view. Um, uh, I, I, it's possible we could see a hike uh, before this year is out, maybe next month. I don't, again, 70% expect, if I'm, you know, 70, 30, 
uh, on the idea that the Fed will not raise, uh, have a hike or indicate a hike uh, starting tomorrow. I just don't see that. I think the, I think this chart, uh, by the way, the decline, the, the severity of what we see gives the Fed a convenient excuse, whether or not it has nothing to do with intrinsically right or wrong, whether it's correct monetary policy or incorrect. I'm not speaking to that. I'm saying merely what has happened historically in the last couple of weeks in the equity sector provides one excuse for the Fed to further kick the can down the road, as it were, and, and not raise rates. They could point to the fragility of at least one sector of our economy, and as such, uh, you know, even though we're having mixed data come out, um, there's some, you know, one week, and there was some data coming out that came out yesterday. But I, th I forgot what it was. I, you know, it was mixed. So one time, you know, one week we'll get a, a positive jobs report or consumer confidence or industrial um, up, um, productivity. Uh, the next week it'll be modified data. So it's back and forth. So they've maintained this policy of uh, allowing or letting their their policy be data driven, which I think in principle is good, but what does that tell us? But again, my view is that the Fed will not raise rates uh, tomorrow. Um, I, you know, again, if I had, if I was doing, when I did a presentation a month or two ago, I would have said we were not going to see a rate hike until next year. Now I can see uh, we're seeing some indications of strength to the point where, you know, a question is on a quantitative setting uh, in a context, is it sufficient for us to have it sooner rather than later? But I just don't see it happening tomorrow. Um, now, if I'm wrong, we'll, we'll make adjustments in everything, in all of the corresponding situations. But how many ticks of protection on bonds? You mean, um, good, I mean, that's a practical question. You know, uh, it's far enough above the highs so that you're not, it's not a random fl internal um, fluctuation. I don't want to risk more than 5% on, 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 on any position I establish as a general, no more than that. I typically risk less. But in terms of, that's not your question. Your question is how more strategically would you place your entering order? Uh, I, you know, I'm going to go down and look at the intraday charts and see where your critical zones of support, well, in this case, yeah, where, where is your resistance? And then somewhere above a, a resistance level. Uh, would determine how I more precisely get work my orders to go long and, and, and establish a long position in the bonds. Okay. Uh, very good. Any other questions, guys? I think we're, uh, let's see, yeah, it's about six after the hour, so we're uh, actually closer to my uh, schedule than I normally am. So I often go much longer than this, but uh, I want to try and keep it as keep things as succinct as possible. But it's certainly, if there are any other questions, I'm I've, okay. Let's see. Um, how many? Okay, let's see. Interpretation of data will be such that they will avoid the rate hike. I I agree. Um, yeah, that's what I was saying, uh, Chef. Yeah, I just think in it and in, in the in the the resolution of in total, all of this, I just don't see it on the horizon. Uh, and, and that's the, one of the more subtle ramifications of that, that I was trying to bring out kind of tangentially earlier in the presentation was, I think the moves that we've seen starting yesterday in the, these major financial sectors, the bonds, the, mark, the stocks, oil, et cetera, are more or less acting as in, a, in, a, as in a defensive sense so as to dampen any information, however, whatever is set forth tomorrow, uh, in the event it, the markets are uh, receiving that unfavorably. This, these are kind of countermeasures on the part of the uh, counter motion on the part of the markets in order to dampen any uh, negative any uh, information that the market might perceive, given whatever uh, policy is enacted or comes forth tomorrow. But I think we'll kind of move back towards a, an equilibrium, um, given I'm, if my scenario of, uh, that I'm projecting is correct, and then. You, then you'll see a normal uh, response to whatever other factors are carrying the day, you know, after we get past this event. Um, again, it would have been a lot easier, it would have been safer, folks, for me to do this presentation Friday or Saturday after the event. Uh, it is what it is. This is what, as traders, we do all the time. We do the analysis, given the information we have at any given juncture, and recognize that we can't buy wholeheartedly, you can't marry it, you have to have some, a modicum of flexibility such that when events and information changes, we are not so uh, severely tied to or attached to any particular viewpoint, we're flexible um, if, the, if, if 
our projections pan out and manifest, great. If not, we make uh, corresponding adjustments as necessary, obviously. Okay. Uh, any other? I guess, okay, folks. Well, again, if you if there's anything you'd like to review, we have recorded today's presentation. Again, oh, uh, let me just show you uh, this. Uh, go back to the last slide. All right. Yeah, it's just... Uh, I have, this is, these are um, past, these are for the stock market past time targets solely. Just as my habit has been uh, very frequently, I'll just indicate some past as well as future. Well, this is the next relevant one for the stock market at 922 and 923. The reason 923 is because it's the autumnal equinox. The major paper assets, bonds, stocks, etc., currencies to some extent as well, um, tend had to mark the calendar the quarterly calendar points tend to mark global changes in, in a macro way for those paper type portions of the economy. I find it of interest that completely based on alternate ideas that I came up with 922. I don't think that's coincidence. 922, 923, it's one day apart. So they're one and the same. I have yet to work out um, my next time target by the next time the next time I do a presentation I will have sure generated and projected a time point after uh, September 22nd relevant to the stock sector in the US uh, but for now that's just my uh, custom to generate these past and the most and this is the next one coming up next week all right and lastly every now and then well more than the now I guess we do mentorships um, or specials uh, I think there is uh, when you fill out the survey when I turn off the um, uh, when I sign off today, you can fill out your information and you're included in a raffle. And then um, Peter Newman again or Frank Cameron, one of the people from the office would call you if you're interested in participating and then you get a membership with either myself or one of my coworkers um, uh, if you'd be interested. But that's the marketing. Again, if you'd like to know in more detail uh, some of the concepts or models and indicators and relationships that I use personally, you at least can reach me indirectly by contacting Pacific Trading Academy at the numbers you see here or, or accessing our website as well. Um, and let's see if there's someone else wrote something here. Okay, let's see. Interpretation data will be such that they will avoid the rate hike. Yes, I think that is the case, Dave. Thank you for, oh, thanks. Thank you for, thanks for guys. It's always a pleasure to share with my latest. Again, we've got some very good, I, I've been telling the traders that I consult and we'll be sending signals probably, you know, to establish the position in the bonds, the stock market, um, especially the Japanese yen, that these are trade, these are three trades in particular, any few, in between now and next week, I think we have great opportunities. And I think some of the moves, I'm not saying that they will be as, as large and extreme as the stock market move we saw in August. Um, they could be, you never know. Uh, but even if they're not, I think we have some, the probabilities are suggesting uh, ample, sufficient volatility to, and if we get positioned correctly and we uh, take into account and set it up so that we're appropriately hedged or protected, I think there's some high probability, reward, good reward risk uh, setups uh, in the offing in the next few sessions between now and the next uh, week or in the end of next, by the end of next week especially. All right. Um, risking being wrong due to the Fed meeting, will, it, will you, uh, what does this say now? Thank you for coming today. Oh, if I'm wrong on what the Fed, if let's say the Fed um, uh, does initiate the hike tomorrow, will I, then I'm doing a presentation Saturday and I will make adjustments. Yeah, sure, definitely. Oh yeah, I have another presentation. Uh, it's for another entity, but, um, and I, I don't know, I don't handle any of the sending out of uh, subscriptions and all that, but yeah, certainly in whatever subsequent um, presentation or wherever I speak, Given if the Fed, if it turns out by the end of tomorrow we have a rate hike and I'm seeing price action that's uh, different, or even if I don't, to the extent new information, I'll give you my latest uh, interpretations. But I am scheduled to have another presentation Saturday, um, and and that would if 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 everything is the same and nothing is and and markets are moving exactly in response to how I'm projecting that they will move at this moment, then I would more or less leave it alone. But if we're seeing in response to uh, different information, different series of events, and correspondingly different responses on the part of the markets, then I'll necessarily make the uh, adjustments to the strategies. All right. Well, thanks for your uh, showing up, folks, and I appreciate your comments and questions. And 
Uh, look forward to our, our next get together. And as always, I wish you until that time, great day and profitable trading in the days and weeks to come. Talk to you soon. Have a great one.